Mr. David Barlow. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President Holloman and your cabinet for inviting me to speak today and welcome uh, to everyone, um, to my uh, fellow trustees, the faculty, students, staff, everyone here. Um, I'd like to address my talk today um, to the students particularly. And really what I'd like to do is to share some of my experiences as a student here at Centenary. I'm a, a 92 alum and uh, describe how those have been important to me in my life and hopefully make that relevant to your lives and, and your future careers. Specifically, I want to I do four things. I want to uh, address a subject matter, a, a course uh, that I took outside my major that really had a direct impact on my career. Um, secondly, I want to address some courses, or one course in particular that I ignored uh, naively when I was here and yet have learned to really appreciate as, as a professional. Um, third, I'd like to address some skills that I feel like I learned here um, at Centenary as a history major um, that have served me well, in some ways maybe were more important than the content I learned. Um, and then finally, I'd like to address the rapidly changing world in which we live and how a Centenary education really prepares students for that world. So geology, is one of several courses I took outside my major that directly impacted my career. I took an environmental geology class here and we went out and saw things and learned. We, we went to the uh, local car washes and saw where runoff is, is collected and we went to uh, the water treatment plant and saw how water from the uh, Cross Lake is, is treated for drinking water for the city of Shreveport. We went to um, study floodplains and how residential and commercial development affected those floodplains. We went um, to the Dole Hills Lignite Mine and we studied about surface mining and reclamation. And what I did not know then, but would later learn, is that those things had a, a real direct impact on my career. Um, I, I uh, later worked as an intern for Senator Jay Bennett Johnson, who was a who was a champion of the Red River Navigation Project, which was one of the things we studied. Um, I would work for the utilities, uh, Swepco and Coleco, who operated the Dole Hills Lignite Mine. Um, I got involved as a lawyer in litigation involving drilling oil and gas wells under Cross Lake. Um, and then I would leave the practice of law, uh, which I did for five years, to join the oil and gas industry uh, and to work in that industry. And what I could not have foreseen then is that um, the combination of uh, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracture stimulation would revolutionize that industry. Uh, but at the same time, it would put strains on environmental resources, most particularly surface and groundwater that we studied in, in geology. So my background here in geology broadened my knowledge really beyond my major and, and prepared me well for for my career and all the challenges that, that I've, I've seen in that. One course that I took um, that I really didn't appreciate at the time, and it's one of several uh, that in hindsight I've really come to appreciate, was psychology. Uh, I naively thought that psychology was only a means to become a, a counselor or a therapist. That was not something that interests me, and so I really ignored it. And what, I, what I've come to learn as an adult and a professional is how important that uh, discipline is. Um, it's just one example of many here at Centenary that broaden your knowledge and become directly applicable in your, in your career. For me, I've worked in family businesses, and a mentor of mine really opened my eyes to how psychological issues often are more important in a family business than a legal or, or a business issue. Um, interpersonal relationships between family members, between siblings, parents, cousins, um, can become very important. and. Um, and my, my mentor, actually, uh, he was a lawyer, taught law, and left the practice of law and teamed with psychologists just so he could help family businesses with these issues. And incidentally, the uh, Centenary Family Business Forum does an excellent job uh, with local families helping with these same issues. It's a great resource for this school and this community. 
psychology, it's interesting, is, is increasingly important in the investing world. Um, we were recently pitched uh, as a business idea investing in a behavioral uh, finance fund. And behavioral finance is an emerging uh, part of the investing world that, that says, okay, in the tw mid 20th century, investors look towards deep fundamental analysis. You can think of people like Warren Buffett or Benjamin Graham. And then in the later in say the 80s, 90s, the efficient market hypothesis and modern portfolio theory dominated. And the proponents of behavioral finance see uh, the next century as uh, being very uh, uh, influenced by cognitive psychology. And in particular, they believe investors' decisions are irrational and that there are all sorts of uh, investing opportunities associated with their irrational behavior, all tied to psychology. Another theme in my education is that the skills that I learned were often more important than the content. Uh, as a history major here, um, I had to do a senior thesis project, I had to pick a subject matter that uh, had previously not been researched. Um, we learned the differences between primary and secondary sources. Um, we had to find both. We had to research the topic. We had to form a conclusion. Um, we had to articulate that position in writing and orally, and then we had to uh, present that before our peers and before scholars. And um, what I found later in life is that in many ways I did the same thing as a practicing lawyer. Um, I would be researching cases and statutes and regulations um, to form a conclusion for a client. And sometimes that conclusion would inform a, a memorandum, other times maybe a, a, an opinion letter, uh, still other times maybe oral argument or a brief to a court, but it was essentially the same process. Even now as a business executive, uh, that same process helps me uh, evaluate and make decisions daily. The skills that I learned here at Centenary really have been invaluable to me in, in my career. And they include things like critical thinking, the ability to do research, to look at things independently, not just look at what someone says about it, but the primary sources of evidence, um, and then form a conclusion and articulate that position. So I'm very thankful for that. Now, this isn't all about me and my education and harkening back to the 1980s and 90s. Um, really what I want to do for, for the students is, is make this relevant to you. And I think if, if the skills that I learned as a centenary student have been valuable to me in my career, which they have been, I think they're even more valuable to you. A, a theme repeated by experts in higher education is that what we do and how we do it is rapidly changing due to technology. A 2013 Oxford study predicts that 47% of current jobs could be automated by the year 2033. Sheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook, highlighted the issue in a Harvard Business School speech when she noted that not only face did Facebook not exist when she got her MBA, but Mark Zuckerberg was only 11 years old. <laughs> it's sort of humbling to think that your future boss may be a kid in middle school. But that's the world we live in. The rapidly changing nature of the world means that the skills you acquire, such as critical thinking, problem solving, writing, speaking, they remain very important. But domain expertise is challenged. Instead of learning a particular subject matter for a specific job that you may have for your entire career, you now must have learning agility. You must be able to become an expert in a particular field, but also to expand or even replace that expertise over the course of your career. This process of discerning the truths through study of primary and secondary sources and peer review, which I learned at Centenary, is contrary to recent concepts of fake news in a post-truth era. Fake news is actually not a new problem, but what is new according to Professor Kit Willman of the University of Colorado, who recently spoke about this subject matter in Boulder, Colorado, where I live, is that media consumers can now choose to only read or listen to media that validates their viewpoints. The antidote, according to Willman, is for news readers and consumers to do their own research and purposefully seek out viewpoints and opinions that differ from their own. 
Post-Truth, which is Oxford Dictionary's 2016 word of the year, is an adjective meaning relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. The Princeton historian Daniel T. Rogers, in a recent article in the Chronicle of Education entitled When Truth Becomes a Commodity, notes that we must find our way back to truth as a result of a public process of search and debate and deliberation. He states, it will take patient and humble experts, less eager themselves for a marketable soundbite. Above all, it will require a renewed commitment to truth's complexities and the processes by which one searches for it. I could not agree more, and Centenary is a place where that can and does happen. My own education in truth happened here at Centenary. It is here that I learned that truth does not always fit well within a soundbite. It is here that I learned that education humbles students by often teaching them how much they don't know. It is here I learned to listen to and respect others' opinions. It is here that I learned truth is complex. And it is here I learned whether studying the Civil War, the Reformation, the Civil Rights Movement, or other monumental historical events about change in society. These themes of change and truth remind me of Robert Frost's poem, The Black Cottage, in which a clergyman recounts his struggles on whether to change the words of the Apostles' Creed. Specifically, the words he looked at were descended into Hades. He feared they were too pagan for the youth of the church. He decided not to change them, however, because of what he called the old bonnet in the pew, who he said would probably not know the difference, but might miss the words like an unsaid good night. Strange how such innocence gets its own way, he notes. Frost concludes the poem with this observation about truth and change. For, dear me, why abandon a belief merely because it ceases to be true? Cling to it long enough, and not a doubt, it will turn true again. For so it goes, most of the change we think we see in life is due to truths being in and out of favor. As I sit here, and oftentimes I wish I could be a monarch of a desert land, I could devote and dedicate forever to the truths we keep coming back and back to. So desert it would have to be, so walled by mountain ranges half in summer snow, no one would covet it or think it worth the pains of conquering to force change on. Well, we do not live in a desert land. There is truth, but change will happen, and our understanding of truth and its complexities will be challenged by that change. My friends, a centenary education is the most important tool we can give you to discern the truth and prepare for that change and indeed to be a part of it. When I accepted the position as chairman of the board, I did so because I passionately believe this and I've seen it in my own career. I know given the outstanding backgrounds each one of you as students brings to this institution and given the, the extraordinarily dedicated and scholarly faculty you have teaching you that you too will thrive with this education and this background. I want to conclude by saying that a liberal arts background is not only practical, it also enriches your lives. It informs how you look at the world. It's the beginning of a lifelong of learning. It opens your eyes to art and music and literature and so many other beautiful things. May your time here at Centenary not only prepare you for a rapidly changing world, but also transform and enrich your lives. Thank you.